Um, so I work for Nutanix in technical marketing. Um, my, for the 10, 15 minutes that I have going through the software architecture um, and some use cases. So there's lots to cover. Feel free to um, ask your questions as we go through it. Um, go ahead. From, so as a, Acropolis 4.5, we broke out our software stack into two main components, uh, Prism and Acropolis. Prism is the distributed management. It's our control plane. Um, it definitely has a lot of value uh, as far as you know, scaling your infrastructure, but also the management layer so it doesn't fall apart. A good example of this is with, um, think, uh, VDI, uh, large-scale deployments. Um, you know, your virtualization management layer can become the bottleneck and slow task down. So this scales in that, in, in that regard. Um, I also believe it's one of the most important um, components from a hyperconverged infrastructure. Because if you think about it, you're taking a monolithic storage array perhaps, breaking that up into four, 16, maybe 100 components, and managing them individually. And so Prism wraps that all together to provide one-click upgrades, provisioning, and really taking the most dangerous part out of the data center, which is us as humans, as far as you know, what's going to cause the most damage. Um, you know, whether it's RAID or you're using type of uh, a RAIN architecture, um, they all have their benefits, but I think it's us as humans, if you have to manually touch those things, it's probably where you're gonna have downtime. It's so very important. <clears throat> uh, the Acropolis side is our multi-resource management. It's the, the heart of the virtualization platform. Uh, we have our data plane, which is the distributed storage fabric. The app mobility fabric is where we're, we're doing DR, orchestration, the ability to move VMs from hy one hypervisor to the other, but also from one hypervisor to a different hypervisor um, is on that plane. Um, but Dwayne, just a, a question on the, on the one-click upgrades and the software that you've got there, and it's a question from Twitter as well. How often does Nutanix release new software that needs to be upgraded on the platform? Uh, as far as, so we use an agile development method, and so typically you'll see every four to six months is kind of a cadence as, like a, as a dot release Okay. anyway. Um, and then part of that one-click upgrade, it does all of the health checks, you know, do I have enough free space? And, and going, kind of going through the laundry list so you don't have to kind of whip, whip through an HCL list and figure out what's going on. Okay. Um, on, the, on the hypervisor side, I don't, uh, you know, it's the choice. I think why we went and have the Acropolis hypervisor is really about delivering the whole stack as far as we have a lot more control on what we can do um, for our customers and really removing it. I think delivering what we would like to deliver is that cloud experience. So you really just focus on your applications. When you can control the hypervisor in the stack, you don't have to worry about you know, HA settings, um, you know, part with scaling, depending on how you're going to set things up. Um, we have that control plane, it's always on, so you don't have to worry about some of the, the routine tasks that you typically would. Um, and then you also have backup and uh, to Azure and AWS as well. So Acropolis is available for six months now? Yeah, it's kind of a marketing redo because it, it has been around um, since uh, NOS 3.0 when it was just KVM based. And How many customers do you have that are implementing Acropolis instead of a ESXi or Hyper-V? Um, I don't have a, a, gr a great number on percentage, and the number's probably skewed too because one of our um, bigger customers also runs it for a, a homemade big data app. Um, but we do have uh, uh, customers such as Nintendo running it. They're actually running Oracle on it. Um, so there, it varies between. It's not just uh, a small remote branch offering. I don't want to hijack it onto this, but you said it's based on KVM? That's right. Or, uh, CentOS. Okay. Is, but then we've stripped out everything that we don't, you know, we don't need. Because we, the appliance, we know what the hardware is. and Tailor it towards the hardware yeah. and all that. And I think, you know, the, the other part of it is a security story where since we can control the whole stack and test it and interop, um, it's uh, something that's not really, when you're like gluing other pieces together, it just doesn't happen. So um, secure by default is kind of the, the messaging. At least today, um, GA, the storage, the storage side, is covered by three um, STIGs, or um, security technical uh, guides, that are DOD and PCI compliant. And you handle all the failover and HA and all the moving parts on the back end? Yeah, all through, through software, so you don't have to worry about multipathing. <clears throat> 
But Dwayne, I see you have AWS and Azure on that. Um, how does how does Nutanix fit into that framework? Or so today, it's just um, backup. That's the what's available today. You can we handle the automation as far as security rules, um, getting that set up. The the longer when you say backup, backing up a hyperconverged compliant uh, appliance to AWS or Azure, is that what you, like cloud storage or something? Yeah, like so that? we have a concept of protection domains, which is just a way to group VMs. You can drag and drop them in, um, then pick you know AWS, whatever region you want to deploy it into, and same with Azure. Um, the long roadmap from .next is also to provide full DR, so you can actually spin up a VM, but that that's not here today. And so Hyper-V v has some capabilities with respect to DR as well uh, for uh, you know, on-site versus uh, Azure. Do you support any of that? Um, yeah, just like if you want to use like a, a vCloud connector to replicate into a, a vSphere cloud, you could do that. Same with Azure. You could use their replication if you want to. We have our own from Nutanix to Nutanix, but that's a, a choice too that you can use. We don't prohibit it. <laughs> um, from an architecture standpoint, we are a node-based architecture. We have um, each node, you need at least three to get going because it is distributed. Beyond that, you can mix and match and grow to whatever you want to get to. There's a controller virtual machine. It takes the, the local resources, um, both HDD and SSD, pulls them together to form the distributed storage fabric. Those nodes talk over a 10 gigabit network, typically. One gig is supported um, on limited scale. And then you get all of the advanced functionalities that you typically would out of your environments. The, the controller virtual machine is not just storage, though. It's also providing Prism, the management interface, also insights to your virtual uh, traffic. We have top of rack support, so you can actually look at a virtual machine, go down to the host, and then also actually look at the top of rack. So if you're not too savvy on the networking side, you can still get some troubleshooting there as well. Um, so Dwayne, on, <clears throat> on your diagram there, you're showing hypervisor on each node. Presumably, you have one hypervisor type on each node? <laughs> um, the clusters today are all of the same hypervisor, with the exception of, um, of the next slide. And so you can... I'm sorry, a cluster, oh. not the node, but the cluster. Yeah, like as far as where the VMs are running today, they all have to be the same hypervisor type. So all ESXi, all Hyper-V, and, and so on. On a node or a cluster? Cluster. cluster. With the exception, we do have a, a storage-only node, where you can take, if you have a cluster of ESXi, because one of the pain points uh, that we saw early on was, well, how, what happens when I just want to add storage to my cluster? What am I going to do? And so people really don't want to pay hypervisor licensing, just add storage. And so we have a storage only node. It's a Acropolis, uh, Acropolis base. You add it into your cluster. Uh, VMs don't run on it, but it'll increase your storage. The, the one pool automatically expands in a way to go. Isn't that slightly ironic that a Hyperconverged company is deploying a storage only node, a bit like putting storage into a storage and service solution. Yeah, I think the, the catch is when, from us, as from a, a distribution point of view, is that you do need to scale resources accordingly. So when you do add the extra node in, it does have um, CPU, it does have memory, and it has flash. Um, and then with the storage only node, when you add that node in, um, since it's one giant pool of storage, you, just, you still get access to the flash. So if you have a, a SQL workload, it can still use that flash as a landing spot for the remote copy as well. How does the storage only node connect to the rest of the cluster? Does it use the same cluster interconnect network or is it connected directly into something? Like is it just Ethernet or is yeah, it? Yeah, just Ethernet, top of rack, okay. switch, plug it up <laughs> and away you go. It'll get discovered and you're off to the races. Oh, a SAN, awesome. I, yeah, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> it, uh, <coughs> um, no, you can go to the next one. Um, so as far as two features, it is tech field day. So talking about our erasure coding and uh, VM flash mode. Um, so erasure coding for us, um, it does not affect the right path. So you can have a highly random nature work and still a it's meant to be uh, write cold, read hot. Um, so we have a concept of uh, an extent group. 
Um, so the extent, the extent group is four megs. It's kind of after everything's been coalesced. And so what we do is we take, we want to form a strip. The strip can be variable length. Um, there's kind of a breaking point, you know, um, for a 401 strip is kind of the maximum that we have found as far as data efficiency goes. After a larger strip doesn't really gain you a, a great percentage on data reduction. And you know, the whole, the whole use case behind it was we use replication factor, not RAID, so kind of 50% of your usable storage can be consumed out of the gate, which is fine for performance and availability, um, but if you're really kind of consumed on capacity, you want to uh, get better data efficiency rates. You can go ahead and... And so the erasure coding, since we have an elastic uh, metadata model where we know where all of the data is sitting at, the, at any one time, we take um, a block or an extent group from each node and form a stripe. We will then t uh, do an XOR on that data to create the parity bit. Um, and then from there, um, we will remove the redundant copies throughout the cluster. So you start out with replication and then move to erasure coding over time as you like coalesce the storage or something like that? Yeah, when it was first brought out, it was set to one hour if you enable the erasure uh, coding on the container. And then we've actually moved it to a day. Um, the, reason, the reason for uh, there was a lot of garbage collection happening. Um, and then it's, you, know, you can set it um, by command line, but... It's, it's almost like offline erasure coding. Yeah. And so, you know, there's no performance penalty from, from reads on that aspect or, or writes. Um, and then... And when a subsequent write occurs to the Stripe, how does that get played out? Um, that would get basically, uh, the write would come in. And this would be kind of nulled and void. And then it would, it would have to form a next strip. And so... That's so it would be the, automatically replicated on the right, And then sometime later, it would be coalesced into a different Stripe. Mm -hmm. So the, as, you know, and that's why it's set to a day, because it's meant for write cold data. But if you know, suddenly these things start getting used, then we use our MapReduce framework to basically um, clean that stripe up and create a new one after the fact. So that's why it's set to a day to, to try to avoid that. Um, and you can, um, go ahead, there's, you can, that's for a one node failure, you can have multiple parities if you want to survive two nodes failing. And so actually the internal code is actually even set up for three nodes with uh, erasure coding. Um, but as far as usable storage, so instead of 2x, you can get to 1.2. And if you're wanting to survive two nodes going down at any one time, you can get to 1.3. And it's very uh, deterministic. It's not like a, you might get this, like if you're talking deduper compression. Uh, it's based on the, the data that's there, and it works with dedupe and compression as well. <clears throat> and it's configurable on a um, volume basis, or, or how how's it? So we, we use containers, um, but the container is from a hypervisor perspective for ESXi, that's NFS, one container of NFS, or um, Hyper-V, it's SMB3. So you could configure one of those containers to be, you know, one parity level, and the other one could be two parity levels if you want it, or is it on a cluster basis, one or two? Or it, it follows the RF rules. So if you if you had a cluster that supported RF three, okay, and RF is replication factor, yeah. yeah. And then it would it would you know pick the the parity that you'd want. That's something I was going to go through in the demo. Also, okay. some, some of the some of the stuff <laughs> containers. You go to the next one. So, um, as far as yeah, just go to the VM VM mode. <clears throat> you can just build it out. So, um, we do have an all flash offering um, with uh, Dell. So, if you really have that workload that needs consist consistent performance all the time, and you don't, you're not worried about ILM kicking in, you do have the ability to use in a converge model. Uh, pin a VM to the flash tier. And so it can be done at a VDisk level. So you can pin one virtual disk on a VM. You can pin the whole virtual machine. You can, you can pin a percentage as well. It's not, it's not a reservation model. So if you already have a workload, um, say that working set is 100 gigs, but the whole VM itself is 500, uh, 
when you go to set it, it's not going to up migrate any data until it's read. And also other virtual machines can use that flash until the pin VM um, takes it as well. By default, you can only use 25% of the available um, flash on your cluster um, for VM pinning or flash mode. It's kind of, um, it's only available in the command line and it's really to prevent, or hopefully to prevent, people from you know, turning like 20 VMs with VM pinning and then you have no flash left for the rest of your workloads. Um, It'll eventually get into the UI, but that's uh, where it's at today. So if you have your ones, you know, you're a, a, maybe a smaller shop or even a bigger one, but you have one workload that you want to make sure it's all in Flash all the time, this is a way you can do it without, without spending the money today. <clears throat> um, I guess the next. <clears throat> um, so as far as solution goes, there's obviously a wide breadth of experience in the room where you can um, uh, run your applications, from uh, Microsoft uh, Exchange, we have an ESRP of 24,000 mailboxes that we've done. Um, one of actually, to get that work done and to have a, on ESXi supported solutions, we invented uh, volume groups uh, to, to get that to run. Um, VDI, one of the uh, largest VDI workloads with the FBI. Um, 600 nodes, 55,000 named users um, is running on Dell XE. Um, from an uh, analytics side, uh, Williams F1, they are a, a Dell XE customer. You know, one of their quotes is talking about they needed a power supply while they were at the track. They got back to their hotel and he was waiting. So that talks about the, you know, Dell's great distribution uh, network. Um, Sorry, could you go over that VDI solution again? Was a how many nodes? Uh, 600 nodes and 55,000 named users. Um, and then uh, as far as you know, other workloads, big data, I kind of lumped the big data into the bare metal. Like, all of the apps that are kind of made for, or invented for bare metal can land on Nutanix as well because of the uh, concept of data locality and with the Acropolis hypervisor. Um, where those application owners may not want to pay the buck for a, for a hypervisor, they still have a very secure and scalable solution that they can run on as well. 